So one of the themes that seems to have been coming up fairly uh, regularly in our monthly Sharing the Dharma Day discussion groups and also in the retreat discussion groups that we have is the pain that people feel when they um, sense that they can't talk to their family members or close friends because they have different political views. And that's been a real pain point for a lot of people coming up to the Abbey. So I was trying to you know, reflect on that in terms of my personal experience, just trying to find an equivalence, um, because I was born and raised in Singapore. And what I thought about was when I was maybe 17, 18 um, in high school. And at the time, I was, as you, some of you know, dead set on becoming an artist. So I was very concerned about censorship laws in Singapore. You know, what I perceived at the time as the country is uh, replacing history with propaganda, you know, very strong views about these things. And my father had a very different view, right? Largely about how censorship is necessary for national security. And, you know, you should be grateful to the government for everything it's done for the country and so forth. Yeah, so very different views. And so at some point, two of us got into a discussion about this. And I just remember it got, somehow it escalated. And by the end of that discussion, I was just so mad. You know, I felt like my head was going to burst. And I thought, this is it, you know, I cannot live in the same house as this man anymore. I have to move out as soon as I can. Um, the next day, he still drove me to school. Um, I did not have the moral courage to get up early and take the bus. Yeah. So there I was in the car, sulking, you know, like just looking out, like, please don't talk to me, whatever. And all of a sudden, my dad just reaches out and says to me, I know how you feel. He says, it's difficult to be in the minority. And somehow him just reaching out in that moment just made all that anger disappear. You know, it's, it was a very important moment in my growing up days, I guess. Um, and I asked him, what do you mean? Yeah, he said, well, you know, in Singapore, people who pursue the arts are not in the mainstream. Yeah, and he said, I know it's a difficult position to be in. <laughs> I was just floored by that expression of empathy and I asked him, you know, how, how do you know? And then he said, well, you know, you remember when I was young, I was involved in student movements um, that, you know, at the time he was going to a Chinese school. So they were kind of left-leaning movements, very involved with standing up for labor rights. And his family was freaked out that, you know, he might get involved in a riot or throw away his future college degree and so on. So he said, I understand yeah, where you're coming from. So, yeah, so maybe part of it I was thinking is, you know, some of this is just intergenerational stuff coming up. Every generation is going to have different views about political developments because we are conditioned differently. Yeah, we've all lived through different aspects and times in history and have our views shaped by that. So that was one piece I thought about. And just how important it was for me at the time that you know, my father reached out with this kind of empathy, that regardless of our different views, um, we can coexist, we love each other, yeah? not, just not to forget that piece. Um, and then another thing I thought about that, that didn't have such a happy ending uh, was a time when I visited my aunt more recently after COVID. And uh, when I went into her apartment, I was really surprised because her husband passed away 10 years ago, but his entire book collection is still completely immaculate on the shelves, untouched. Yeah, and they're very clean. So clearly, you know, she's been cleaning them, but she doesn't read those books and they're just still there. So there's that grief piece. But the second thing that really surprised me just looking at the books was I realized he had like the complete works of Mao Zedong. Yeah, the Chairman Mao. Yeah. And now my uncle is born and raised in Singapore. You know, he's not, he has, I, I'm sure he's visited the mainland in China, but you know, that's not where he was born and raised. Yeah, but he had the complete works of Mao. I think just about every book about Chinese communism there was, including books about the eight revolutionary operas that could be performed during the Cultural Revolution um, and with their scores, uh, which I personally have a slight you know, I have, I have my own fascination with those operas, but anyway, that's why I knew about them, and I was like, how does he have these books? Yeah, so I didn't know so much about my uncle. Um, I, I knew he was a Chinese language teacher, but I didn't know that was, you know, his kind of fascination with Mao to that degree. So I remarked on this, and my aunt said, well, you know, you remember your cousin uh, is married to a woman from China, and she said, when her father-in-law came to Singapore to visit, uh, he got into a raging argument with your uncle. You know, two of them just argued till they were red in the face about Mao. 
And he was just flabbergasted that this kind of immigrant Singapore Chinese man was was worshiping Mao because for him, having lived in China through the Mao years, uh, he did not share that view. And my aunt said it ended with, you know, the father-in-law from China yelling like, you only worship Mao because you were not duped by him. Yeah, so it got like really heated and it kind of ended there. And so I was just thinking back, you know, this, these two men coming together in that brief interaction, right? They're, now they're family, uh, but they wound up fighting over what? You know, this man who neither of them really know, it's, just, it's like their ideas about what he stands for. And then now one of them, my uncle has passed away. I don't know where the father-in-law is now. Um, what did that argument do? Did it benefit anyone? <laughs> you know, did it relieve the suffering of anyone? So it just seems like such a sad way for that interaction to have gone, yeah, over the legacy of, of this figure. Um, yeah, does it matter or not to have this kind of raging argument that, you know, causes you to just, yeah, decide not to speak to each other again, I guess. Yeah. So that was another piece I thought about. Um, and then more recently, I have been reading this book called Road to Heaven, Encounters with Chinese Hermits. It's, it's written by an American translator who enjoys translating the poetry of hermit monastics, both Taoist and Buddhist, uh, in China. And he goes by the name Red Pine, that's his pen name. Um, and interestingly, this book has been translated into Chinese and is a huge sensation in China. Um, I think because people just thought this whole tradition of people being hermits in the mountains had died out during the Cultural Revolution. So people are just amazed that he was able to find all these people. I mean, literally, he just walked into the hills repeatedly to look for them. Um, and I think that informs his translation as well. So that's why he, he translates these poems very beautifully, having kind of been in those environments where the hermits live and experiencing their lifestyle. Yeah. Anyway, I, I just love this book too because you know I personally would never be a hermit, but I could sure hike and write a book about them or talk to them. I, I want to talk to hermits. I don't actually want to be one. <laughs> so I really resonate with this writer. <laughs> um, so anyhow, so here's a little passage in his book that that uh, I thought was really interesting. So here he talks about how he, um, I'll just read it. So he said, the next day, Steve, um, his photographer, and I left the Xi'an area and we continued our odyssey across central China, climbing other mountains, talking to other hermits. Most of them were Buddhists, but many were Taoists. Most were monks, but many were nuns. Most were old, but many were young. They were all poor, but they had a way of smiling that made us feel we had met the happiest and wisest people in China. One of the mountains we visited was uh, Tai Lao Shan, just inside the northwest tip of Fukien province. A Buddhist layman we met on the trail led us to a cave where an 85-year-old monk had been living for the past 50 years. In the course of our conversation, the monk asked me, who is this Chairman Mao that you keep mentioning? He said he had moved into the cave in 1939 after the spirits of the mountain appeared to him in a dream and asked him to become the mountain's protector. He hadn't been down the mountain since then. Disciples and local villagers brought him the few things he needed, and he didn't need much, flour, cooking oil, salt, and once every five years or so, a new blanket or set of robes. His practice was the name of the Buddha Amitabha, the Buddha of the infinite. After so many mountains and so many hermits, we were finally feeling at home with the infinite. So yeah, that just knocked my socks off too, that he had no idea who Mao was because he just had done his practice in the mountains. Um, yeah, that, you know, just to think of this person who has this huge legacy that has touched even the lives of the immigrant Chinese who never lived under his rule, right? Like my uncle and my parents who were interested in his ideology for a period of time. And here's this person who lived in China, but in the mountains and his mind was untouched by Mao in any way. So yeah, who is Mao anyhow, right? He's an ordinary sentient being who is suffering, right? He was an ordinary, you know, the person we know as Mao. Ordinary sentient being suffering, who was in power for a brief period of time, who, in my opinion, uh, had a lot of policies that did tremendous harm and damage. But I'm sure a lot of people too felt he did things that were beneficial and you know, unified China and so on. 
And whatever my opinion is or your opinion is, uh, his mind stream has moved on and is definitely still suffering in cyclic existence. So yeah, I think that kind of summarizes my reflections on the recent election, perhaps, that no matter what, I think first order of the day is to heal the relationships of those who are karmic, of, of ourselves and those who are karmically closest to us, right, with our friends, with our family, to work out those points of division that have really been painful for people in these couple of years and might still continue to be, that's where we have a sphere of influence and connection. And then whatever happens with very powerful people and so forth, uh, to know they are suffering. And yeah, no matter what happens, it is up to us to liberate our own minds. You know, Whatever our opinion is, the important thing is to liberate our minds from ignorance, attachment, and anger. There's no way anybody can do that for us. Uh, they also cannot stop us from doing that. 